I told you last uh, Wednesday evening, having begun Matthew, our study through Matthew, chapter 1 last week, that I felt like there were some loose ends that I wanted to uh, share highlights. And I felt uh, led to do that again with chapter 2. I'm reminded again of the feeding of the 5,000. At the end of that, Jesus told his disciples, he said, take these baskets and gather up any fragments that remain. Well, I'm sure there's a lot more fragments that remain from Matthew chapter 2 than I shared this past Sunday and that I will share highlights of this evening. But I felt that we should go back there. Matthew 2, of course, is the story of the wise men. The first uh, uh, 12 verses involved them. And then uh, Herod's plot to kill that uh, king of Judea. And, of course, the angel that directs Joseph and his little family to flee into Egypt and then come back and settle in Nazareth. That's the, that's the story of Matthew chapter 2, as you recall. What I'd like to do tonight is take the truths that specifically pertain to Joseph and God's dealing with him and use it as a, an illustration of what it means and what it looks like to walk with God. You want to do that? You know, as a father, and of course now as a grandfather, one of the uh, most exciting things for parents and grandparents is to see the little ones begin to take their first steps and learn to walk. It's a lot of fun, and it's, it's a great event. I want us to enter into a greater walk than that. I want us to enter into a great adventure, a joyous life that I call walking with your God, walking with your Heavenly Father. Hey, as a father, the joy that I get from seeing my children and grandchildren learn to walk, what must our Heavenly Father, what joy must that give him when he sees his children learning to walk with him? If there's anything I want you to get, if there's anything that we as believers all need to learn, we need to learn how to walk with God. You agree with that? I think that that is exactly what would thrill the heart of God. And chapter 2 in Matthew reveals some important truths, I think, to anyone that is serious about learning to walk and continue to walk with God. And there are three main truths that I want to emphasize about walking with God from this passage. But let's pray first. Lord, you pointed these things out. Now I pray that you'll help me to point them out to the people that are here and those that are tuned in via the internet. We pray that you would use these simple truths to really open our understanding and to also grip our hearts. And if there is not a desire to walk with you, would you put that desire deep within the heart of people tonight, your people? We pray this for the glory of Jesus, through whose name we're able to ask it. Amen. Walking with God. And the thing that uh, I want to bring out from Joseph's life, first of all, is that walking with God requires you to follow God closely. That's simple. To follow God closely. Now, obviously, uh, the wise men followed God's direction through the star that he uh, made appear and then reappear to them. But a personal reality of walking with God I see it clearer in Joseph's life here in chapter 2 of Matthew. He is given four dreams, one in chapter 1, and then three dreams in chapter 2. All of them dreams that come from God, and through those dreams, God speaks to Joseph directly and clearly leads him as to what he's to do. Now, 
I don't count on and I don't look to dreams uh, from God to direct me. I look into his word. And I'm not saying that God could never use a dream, but if he did, you'd know it would be from him, and you'd know clearly what he's trying to tell you through it. In fact, I find in the scripture, whenever God connects with someone, they know it's him speaking, and they know exactly what he's saying. The way in which you walk with God is, first of all, to follow God closely. I see that in Joseph's life through the way that the Lord deals with him in this second chapter, how God connects with him, how God leads and directs him, and how Joseph immediately, without questioning, does what God tells him to do. And that's very encouraging to me, to us. But one of the things that I want you to understand about following God closely or having God's leading in your life is the occasion in which it happens. Now, in Joseph's experience, of course, it was extraordinary uh, things that were happening, and it required extraordinary uh, uh, ways of leading him, i.e., the dreams that God gave him. God will not use extraordinary means if they're not necessary. You need to learn to listen to the whisper of God. You need to learn to hear that still, small voice. If you're going to follow God closely, you have to have your ears open and listening for that smallest whisper. Because God speaks in the... Uh, in, in the routine of our daily life. And he does it in our ordinary circumstances. And as I said a minute ago, there should be no expectation of extraordinary direction if the ordinary is available to God. Mm. If you're going to walk with God, it's going to require that you follow him closely that you take opportunities that he affords you to do so. That you believe that God has led you so far, and as a result of that, he's not going to abandon you now, even if it looks as if he's nowhere to be found. Give God the opportunity. Keep, keep on taking the next step, that faith-obedient step that God leads you into, and I'm telling you, God will direct you, and he will enable you to, to, to do what you can't do on your own. What I'm saying is, stay dependent on God, and you're going to find that he's going to enable you when you depend upon him, and you're going to experience God's presence. You know what God's presence really comes down to? You're going to see God work. Yeah. You're going to experience God working in your life, in your circumstances, in your behalf. That's what the presence of God really comes down to, and it happens in ordinary daily life. Another thing that I see in following God closely in the life of Joseph is that even though he had the occasion and the opportunity he took advantage of, he, in following God closely, faced opposition, didn't he? But he trusted God to protect him. And God did just that. When God directed him to flee to Egypt, God was protecting him. He was walking with God, trusting God to protect him. You know, God knows the enemy's moves before he ever exercises them. God knows what the enemy has in mind before the enemy ever moves, before he ever takes action. And so you can trust God's protection. Follow him closely by realizing that even the opposition, God is in charge of this. God will lead you. God will protect you. And when you believe that, it brings joy to your heart regardless of what the opposition might be. It's a, it's a, a reassurance that no matter what, if you're following closely, God's presence is with you. And you'll see it. You'll experience it. And God
God's working in your life. Okay, that's the first thing. Walking with God. In Joseph's life, we see following God closely. Here's the second thing I see in Joseph that is a lesson on how to walk with God. Secondly, know God intimately. Follow God closely, but secondly, know God intimately. Certainly, the one who God speaks to and God directs like Joseph has learned to know God and to know God on a very deep personal level. Now, you and I should be coming to know God on an ever-increasing deeper level. If you don't know God any more than you knew him 10 years ago, something's off in your walk. There should be that increasing intimacy in your walk with the Lord, if you're walking with him at all. There should be that closeness. God is very, very near human souls, and especially the believer. He's not only with us, he is in us, the scripture says. And God's delight, if you haven't discovered it yet, is to have fellowship with us. God delights to do that. And when we don't bother to have fellowship with him, that hurts the heart of God. I'm telling you that God wants closeness with you. I see it from Genesis to Revelation, from the, the very creation where he's walking with man in the cool of the day in that Garden of Eden to the New Jerusalem where it's said that now the dwelling of uh, God is with man. That's what he's been working towards. That's, what his, that's one of his main redemptive purposes is we might have that closeness with him. And so, if we're going to know God intimately, if we're going to have that closeness, we can't be like the Jewish leaders in Matthew chapter 2. They were very careless. They were careless. In fact, they and Jerusalem as a whole knew nothing about the king that was born five miles away in Bethlehem. They weren't even interested in that. They didn't want anything to do with that. The Jewish leaders, when asked by uh, King Herod, they, they were certain where Messiah was to be born, but they didn't care at all to personally discover God for themselves. And I would say this, while you may not be like them, we need to always be aware that familiarity breeds indifference. Get to know God, know God intimately, but don't get casual with God. Don't become careless in your time spent with Him. Don't get overly familiar with him. Always remember who he is. The great God that we've just sung about. Oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. You want to walk with the Lord? You have to come to a place where you know God intimately. Don't tolerate cold-heartedness. That's our natural condition. But it doesn't have to be that way for me and you. And cold-heartedness is simply being satisfied with the knowledge of the Bible. Let me tell you something. Head knowledge of Scripture is totally insufficient. It is absolutely worthless. And yet the constant temptation is to substitute knowing for being. Knowing about God for being godly. Knowing about God not being like God. Don't do that. In fact, if we know and it doesn't change us 
we are living a life of self-deception. That's what James says in the first chapter. We look into the Word of God, we see it, and we, we see the, the necessity of change, but we don't bother to apply it to our life, and we deceive ourselves. You substitute head knowledge for submitting to God's will that you know what God wants for you in his word. If you try to substitute head knowledge for submitting to the will of God and trusting God out of a heart full of love for him, you are just fooling yourself. You're not fooling anyone else. You're certainly not fooling God. It is only a heart knowledge that will give you hope and purpose in your life, and that will result in a joyful life. Jesus is a person to be loved. He is not an idea to be accepted. You see, this is the big, uh, this is the big mistake that even Christians make so often. That uh, it's all about correct doctrine. Correct doctrine has its place, obviously. But it is about a personal relationship with this Lord. It's about knowing Him intimately. You follow God closely. You know God intimately. And then the third and final thing I want to, uh, to take away from the life of Joseph here in Matthew 2 and actually, this uh, is not Joseph, but it is the wise men. Verse 11. When the wise men finally got to where uh, the Messiah was, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. You want to walk with God, follow God closely, know God intimately, and thirdly, worship God only. Worship God only. You know, it's so easy to worship substitutes. It's so easy to worship idols. What kind of idols do Christians have in their lives? What kind of idols do Believers, what are they found guilty of worshiping at times? Tell me. Politics. Politics could be one, yeah. What else? Electronic devices. Okay. Even relationships can replace our relationship with God. We can put our, our love relationships or even our family, family before God. Money, entertainment, yeah. whatever. It, there's a lot of idols that we don't even think about that uh, when it comes down to it, we're not worshiping the Lord. We've allowed these things to replace. That's all we talk about. That's what our life revolves around. They're substitutes for God. And yet, he is to be the number, worshiping God is the number one priority. It's the principal purpose that you're alive, is to worship him. I could say that you were made for this. You were made by God to worship him. That's the purpose for which you were born, to be a worshiper. And that is what makes all human life worthwhile. If you're not worshiping, your life is worthless. I'm sorry. That's as blunt and plain as I can put it, but that's the truth. Worship God only. What we see these wise men doing is really, worship is a mentality. It is a mindset. It is that God should have your full attention all the time. That you should be totally focused on the Lord. And when you are, you will be oblivious to yourself. You won't be talking about yourself all the time. You'll be talking about the Lord all the time. You won't be pitying yourself all the time. You'll be glorifying the Lord. It's a mentality. It's a mindset. I think one of the biggest wastes of time in life is to mainly focus on ourselves and even other people and things. So worship God only is a mentality 
And you know what it requires? It requires humility. See these men when they get there, what do they do? They worship him. How do they worship him? Well, they don't say a word. They fall down. In other words, they just prostrated themselves before the Lord. They fell on their belly. They bowed as low as they possibly could. They're absolutely silent. You don't hear you don't see any words being spoken by these wise men. It says they worshiped and fell down before him. No words, just the quiet realization that we're in the presence of God. We're in the presence of the Lord. And let's let God have a chance to speak. And let's be quiet in his presence. And let's just open our ears to hear what he has to say to us. And let's bow in reverence. It's the right attitude for worship is just absolute humility. Absolute humbling of oneself in the presence of the Lord. Worship God only. It's a mentality that requires humility. And look at what it involves. They fell down, they worshipped him, and they opened up their treasures and they presented these gifts to him. Worship involves generosity. A sacrificial giving of yourself first and then all that you have to God, you hand over your possessions to the Lord. You say all of it? You know what Jesus said to a group that wanted to be his followers? He said, except you turn your back and say goodbye and forsake all that you have. You can't be my disciple. You can't follow God closely unless you're willing to give it all to Him. Put it all in His hands. Put it all at His disposal. Put it all in His power. And let Him have the right to say what goes to this and what goes to that. To use it as he sees fit. Trusting that if he sees fit to use more than you think you can afford, you can trust him to supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's that spirit of sacrificial generosity. You can trust God. You know, recently, I felt I, I ought to give money to an unsaved person just for my testimony to that person, my testimony for the Lord to that person. And so I asked God to show me the amount that he wanted me to give, and he put an amount in my, in my heart, and so I gave it, and it was a rather large amount. And afterwards, afterwards, I... I started the second thing, you know, and oh, I, I probably shouldn't have given that much. And the Lord just said to me, wait a minute, didn't you ask me how much to give? And he reminded me of uh, 2 Chronicles 25, 9, where King Amaziah had hired a, a mercenary army to help rescue him from enemies that were attacking uh, the, the uh, country of Israel. And um, God rebuked him for that. And he says, well, but I've already paid them off. And you know what God says to him? Uh, I'm able to give you much more than this. I can take care of it. Yeah, you may have lost the money, but it's okay. I'm going to take care of you. You can trust me in this. Whatever we give as unto the Lord, don't ever worry about it. Don't ever try to second guess it because you'll never be able to outgive God. He's going to take care of you. You want to walk with God? You know what? Oh, here, listen to this. A walk with God is really not for you. It's for Him. Because it's people that walk with God that He is able to use to get His work done on this earth to advance his kingdom, to build his church. It is through people, God's people, 
And so, God's purpose is not based upon our ability, but is simply based upon His ability to work through us, and then He gets the glory and not us. If you really desire to walk with God, then you've got to follow Him closely. You've got to know Him intimately. And you have to be careful to keep yourself from idols so you worship God only. Amen. Let's pray after I say this one thing. How can I illustrate it? What I'm trying to talk about. You remember the old uh, vessels? They were sailing vessels. Well, think of this. Think of an old uh, sailing ship. And uh, the, the, the sailors on it have just swabbed the decks. They're sparkling clean. They have painted all the trim. It's gleaming. They have stocked the galley, the kitchen, with all the food supplies they're going to need for their voyage. They have uh, untied and pulled in all the ropes. They've lifted up all the anchors. They've put the sail up. But that boat, that ship's not going anywhere until the wind blows. That's right. Did you know in both the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, in both cases, the word for wind and spirit are the same? The word for wind, breath, and spirit are the same Hebrew word and the same Greek word. I'm telling you, until the Spirit of God is allowed to breathe upon the sail of your life, you'll never be carried along in a walk with God. Until you allow Him to breathe in deep into your soul, until you allow Him to, to blow upon your life, his life-giving spirit. You'll never walk with the Lord. Think about that as we close. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you might use this in our lives. Thank you for the example of Joseph and these wise men that give us uh, pointers on how to walk with God. And that is something that ought to really occupy our thinking and be our great desire we would follow you closely, know you intimately, and worship you only. May that be true more and more in our life. In Jesus' name.